takes a lot of courage to tell your story. A lot of us have different stories, but I've discovered almost all of us struggle in some way with our family, with who we are, with where we grew up, with the voices of what people said, of the labels that we've been placed on ourselves. And a lot of that, to be honest, has come through our relationship with our daddies. I don't know how many times I've talked with people and they've pulled me aside and say, I know you talk about God as your heavenly father, but I need to tell you that's really hard for me because I wasn't close to my father. Or my father was very difficult. I'd like us to do something. If you don't mind putting the slide up for me, Scott. We're going to sh share a prayer. No normally, I don't use canned prayers. I don't do that. I speak honestly uh, from my heart. But today, I want us to read a prayer. And um, as I do that, it's centered around the whole idea of our good, good father. And, and I want to remind you of what Pam said. Our identity governs our circumstances. Our identity in who Jesus is, who he is as the good, good father, but also who we are. And how loved we are. And that overcomes every circumstance we face. And I'm going to just suggest that as I go through the sermon today, for many of you, the problems you have with your spouse or with your children or with your parents or with your job, your future, can be found back to this issue. Who, who am I and who are you? So we're going to read a prayer. It's actually taken from a book by Tony Evans, Praying to the Names of God. And I've just modified it to fit us a little bit today. But I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you don't mind. And don't worry if you're not a good reader. Just read along with us. We're going to read it out loud. I think there's power in hearing us. He who confesses Jesus Christ is Lord with his mouth. There's something just in faith in saying it. And it's going to work through this model of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Four slides. And I'd like to have you read this with me as a prayer. And we're going to read it slowly, but read it being aware that uh, you're talking to the Father. And if you're at the connection watching this on a video, I want you to read it as well, okay? So let's read it together. Abba, you are a father to the fatherless and a defender to those in need. I lift up your name in praise and adoration. I acknowledge you as my father, a father who is always there when I need you. Sometimes our earthly fathers abandon us or don't know how to be there when we need them, but you fill the gap, bringing comfort and guidance. Can you adore him today as your father? Let's confess together. Abba, many times I forget that you are there. You are God, you are creator. You are holy. I confess that sometimes you feel distant. Help me to experience your presence and to know that you are near. As my Abba Father, you are indeed closer to me than even a good father is to his child. When I am afraid, I will trust in you because you hold my life in your hand. You hold my heart your own. Abba, thank you for not leaving me as an orphan. My earthly father can't be everything I need in a father because no human being is perfect. Only you are perfect. Only you provide me with all of the loving, gentle care a daddy can give. Thank you for your patience, kindness, and goodness. Thank you for being only a breath away. When I whisper your name, Abba, Father, you hear. Do you know that? Are you thankful for that? Did you cry out to him even this past week? It says in Romans chapter 8 that we cry out, Abba, Father. And he hears us and he comes to us, the Lord of the universe. Finally, our supplication, our prayer for more. Abba, Father, I want to know you more. I want to experience your presence more. I want to live each day of my life, your fullness, and in the peace that comes from trusting you. Show me how to look to you as my Father. Guide me with every decision and step I take. Fill me. Father God, as I pray over my friends today, for some of us, we've somehow disconnected with you as our Heavenly Father, for whatever reason it might be. <laughs> Today I want them to know, I want you to show us that you're only a breath away, only a word away, the good, good Father who loves us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen, amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. It seems like everyone's talking about identity these days. A lot of services I go to, it was just a few weeks ago that I think Pastor Aaron talked about it. Um, I have discovered that whenever I listen to a podcast now, they seem to be talking about identity. So if you're just bored of hearing this topic, maybe you need to especially listen today. I didn't realize that I struggled with my identity. And as I worked my way through this today, I realized that do I really know who I am? To take out your ID, your Minnesota driver's license, for example, and look at it, it tells me how tall I am and how much I thought I weighed but don't really weigh, and it tells us what our eyes colors are, and it tells us all these things about statistics in our life, but it's really not our identity. It's, it's an ID card, but it doesn't describe me. A lot of people have done like Pam, and we've done DNA tests, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but many of you have done that go into ancestry services and find out who our families are. I love the people that go on Facebook and find out they're Italian, right? You ever do that where you hold it up to your... I don't understand how that works, but it doesn't work, okay? But a lot of people are coming back with stories about, about who they are and who they're connected to, and, and a lot of people have been shocked with their discoveries. Did, did you hear this story just the other day on the news? This was amazing here in Minnesota. These two young ladies, they're actually in their 70s now, but one did a DNA test and realized she had nothing in common with her parents. Nothing. And she was startled. She said, wait, wait a second. Mom and Dad, did you adopt me? They said, no, you're ours. We took you home from the hospital. Well, they continued to do some research. And she always wondered. She was a blonde with a bunch of brunettes and couldn't figure out why they were so athletic and she wasn't. And, and all these questions that just continued. And they went and did some research. And when they were born in a hospital in St. Paul, someone gave the wrong baby to the wrong family. And so Denise went home with Linda's parents, and Linda went home with Denise's parents. Can, can you believe that? 71, you find out your parents aren't your parents. That you grew up with brothers and sisters that really weren't your brothers and sisters. And, and just it has been amazing how these two have come together and started sharing experiences. And it raises all these questions about nurture and nature, right? Who are we by nurture and nature? And, and one should have been a softball star because her whole entire family is in the Hall of Fame of Minnesota. But, but one that was in that family, she liked to read instead. And it just is amazing to hear their stories, our, our identities. Now, maybe you weren't switched at birth, but you ever feel like the odd child out? Um, maybe you didn't have this kind of an incident happening. And by the way, all the caregivers are probably dead and gone by now, so there's no one to feel guilty about this. But they're happy. They made some new friends. They find out they kind of have a new sister. They have more parents. But I believe we struggle with our identity, not so much because they've been switched, but because we've listened too much to the evil one. There's a liar in this world that tries to give us what I call is the identity trap. And these traps are set all around us, where we determine who we are by the wrong questions. I love Joe's who, when, where, why, how, right? Like, like who am I? And oftentimes we go to where I live, or who I know, or what I make, or what I drive, or or how old I am, or how I look. It's amazing how simple things become our identity. Every person here has built their identity, sometimes on these traps. The most significant trap to me is probably this performance trap. You learned early on as a child that you're only good as your last great thing. So for some of you, you have this performance trap, and it's difficult to go to work because you're only good as the last big sale. Only as good as the last great presentation. Only as good as the last great review. And we're constantly going through life trying, trying to do bigger and better things because our identity is built on our performance. What we do on the athletic field or what we do in the band that we're in or in our neighborhood and, and constantly driven by performance. Do you know Dwayne Casey? Remember who that is? He used to be the coach for the Minnesota Timberwolves. You know what he did this past year? Like he went on to Toronto and did an amazing job. They had one of the best records in the NBA. Do you know that Dwayne Casey was named coach of the year this last year? And two days later, he was fired. That's the world we live in. What have you done for me lately? He brought his team to the best record they've ever had. And Canadians are usually pretty nice guys. And they fired him. Why? Because he didn't win the playoffs. And that's the world you live in. I just need to tell you, man, you go off to work, and, and though they appreciate you, you need to keep performing. 
Young ladies, you, you work in the home or you work out, out, out in the, the business world ju just as much so. You need to perform. You need to compete. You need to do better. And we send our kids off to schools, and the schools are driven by whether or not mom and dad gets a, it's a bumper sticker that says they're the best students in the class. And, and a lot of us are just driven by this trap called performance. I think there's another one called the comparison trap. It happens a lot in church. When I find people don't like coming to church, one of the reasons is they feel like they're being compared to everybody else. Just when they're waiting in line to check their kids in, if their kids aren't behaved, ah, these aren't my kids, somebody else's kids, <laughs> or how we're dressed, or how we look, or what car we drive into the parking lot, and, and we all try and measure up to some kind of standard, and, and I, I have to tell you, this comparison trap leads to lots of trouble. Usually it leads to either pride, I'm... I'm better than you. No, not better than her, but better than you for sure. And there's this pride that happens because our identity is based on being better than somebody or jealousy. Boy, I wish I was in their family. Boy, I wish I had his job. Boy, I, I wish I had her husband. And there's this constant degrade. And I've discovered that many of us in this comparison trap end up belittling ourselves. How many of you believe you're nothing? Well, I, I can't do anything. Where, where does that come from? It comes from the pit of hell. Because we compare ourselves with other people. And yes, we're not created equal. And there are different gifts and abilities. But I need to tell you that you measure up because the Father created you. Thirdly, the opinion trap. This is the one that I think I find myself in constantly aware of what people are saying about us. Like, why didn't Joe call me a stud? You are. Oh, thank you, thank you. He's there still. See, I was just waiting. You know, Tyler is younger, but my goodness, I've been around. I got four kids. <laughs> and, you know, we, we just have constantly driven by opinions. You know, when I, maybe I'm strange. You ever put your credit card in, you know, and you put it in? And you know what it says after you, right before it's take it out? What, you know what it says? You're approved. I celebrate that every time. <laughs> I'm approved. Look, I'm approved. And a lot of us are just driven by this approval addiction. And your idea is only as good as the last person who said, it's so nice to see you. Uh, some of you get so discouraged and depressed at the end of the day because not enough people stroked you or complimented you or said good things to you. We're constantly needing to be validated by other people. And this, my friends, is a trap because it's never enough. And if you're here today on this Father's Day and you're just not aware of who you are in Jesus, you are heading towards a crisis. You see, I believe identity traps lead to an identity crisis. This is my connection. I don't know if you'll read it any other place, but I really believe that happens. If you're basing your identity on anything other than what God tells you, it leads to a crisis. It's interesting, <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount, if you recall that, Jesus says these profound things. It's the one sermon that people in the world remember. And at the end of it, if you remember, they pat him on the back and they say, that was good. You know, they try and give him that validation. And Jesus just looks at all these people and he says this, you know, what I've spoken is true. And if you build your life on it, it's going to change everything. And what does that marvelous image of the wise man building on the solid rock and when the storms come, the, the building stands. And then he talks about the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. You know what that is? It's our identity in other things. It's listen to the words of other people. The rain comes down, the streams rise up, the winds blow and beat against their life. And it falls with a great crash. Midlife crisis. You built your identity on the wrong thing. And you come to a place where all of a sudden does it fit anymore. Full, full life crisis. People have built their entire life through retirement, gone through the boxes and, and come to the end and say, who am I? What have I done? Or, or quarter life crisis is big nowadays. 25 years old and I don't have the big job and the big place and the big family and, and struggle with who we are. And, and the kids move out and no longer this empty nest is so attractive. And, and the kids move home and it's worse. And, and we have all these struggles with our identity. Who am I? Am I doing okay? It's interesting. Lots of times, Bob and I always laugh about this, the difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day. You ever, you ever hear the difference? First of all, Mother's Day presents are more expensive on the average. 
always. We spend more on mom. And, and secondly, usually we pat mothers on the back. Oh, you, you work so hard and you're so good and you're so tired and we try and encourage you. And, and then it comes to Father's Day and we take out the whip and beat you a little bit. <laughs> you're not doing your job. Come on, man. If men just bit. I'm not going to do that. I believe all of us, men and women together, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, struggle with this identity. And some of you are heading towards a crisis. And like Pam, unless you know that your identity in Jesus Christ governs your circumstances, you are liable to crash and fall. The storms will come and it will break you down. I just want to share four things, four truths that just have really helped me in this. And, and these not, might not be where you are, but the message says this in Romans 12. And I love this. This is a chapter about gifts. And, and some of you read that chapter and you, you look for, where am I in that? And I just love how, how I believe Paul starts it. He says, the only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and what he does for us. Not by what we are and what we do for him. That, that's, that's worth the sitting down today. Who am I? It's, it's who you are. And it's not what I can do for you. It's what you've already done for me. And I say that there's nothing that I can do to make God love me more. There's nothing that I can do to make God love me less. My identity is found in who he is. And what he's done. And I could give you verse after verse. But what I'd like to do is just focus on a couple. And, and the one that I just can't get out of my mind is Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. And I actually quoted this on Mother's Day as well. It's, it's been kind of just a theme in my life the last little while. And Paul says very simply, you were created by him and for him. That, that should be a mantra that you just have built your life upon. I, I was created by him and for him. Just imagine building your identity on that solid rock. That I've been created as an original. Psalm 139 says, fearlessly and wonderfully made. You are. God knit you together before anybody saw you in your mother's womb. Now, I, I don't know what you think about, but for nine months, God was working on a masterpiece, and that was you. And there's no one like you. I'm not a scientist, but they tell me that all our fingerprints are this different. Now, whoever figured that out? Have they really checked all the people in the world and compared them? <laughs> but they say our fingerprints are completely different. Our irises, the, the people have been able to look, and we've got some eye doctors who could help me with this, but when they look in, they say everybody's eye is different when they look inside. Yeah, I always love this. If you haven't heard me tell this, this is one of my favorite stories. Two snowflakes were falling outside a window. And they looked inside the window and saw the group of people, and these snowflakes in this story talk. And, and they're coming down, and they're talking to each other, and they said, you know, looking at the people, no two of them are the same. You get that? <laughs> we say that about snowflakes. It's the same about you. My identity, there is no one like me. I, I'm an original. Aren't you glad there are none others like me? Or like you? No, I always believe there's this doppel, whatever they call them. Somebody that's like me or looks like me, but not, not completely. I am completely unique. You are an original. Nobody like you. So why are you comparing yourself with other people? Why, why are you trying to measure up to other people? Why, why are you trying to be like other people? You are you. And God created you as an original. I was reading some statistics, and it was a gentleman who understood DNA, and he said if you take the chromosomes, what are the 23 chromosomes that you receive from your mother, and you mix them in all the combinations, there can be 10 million different combinations. And then if you take the chromosomes of your father, 23 more, and you mix them together, that's another 10 million and then if you take your parents, your grandparents, and your ancestors, and you take all those together, the probability that you became you was gazillion, gazillion, or something like that. I think it was a made-up number. You're really big. The probability that we mixed the, the soup together and create another you is impossible. You are an original. Charles Darwin, which I think is interesting, his title, The Origin, Original, the origin of the species. Man with all his noble qualities still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. Go out and change the world, guys. You're nothing but scum from the pool. When I look at you, I recognize that there's nothing in you that's really, truly noble. Though you act noble, really, you're not. That, that's what he says. I can't disagree more. 
I can't disagree more with the statement. You have the print of the Almighty God on you. The fingerprints of the Creator have formed you and fashioned you. And there's no one like you. Stop trying to be like your brother. Stop, stop trying to imitate your sister. Stop trying to be so different from your father. Be, be you. Because God created you as an original. I also think that we were created by him, but also for him. Just think about what that means, for him. There's a purpose. God, God created me so different than anybody else, and he gave me a purpose. And my life goal is to find out what that purpose is. My identity in him, I was created, and he gave me these gifts and these abilities and these opportunities, and, and I'm so different than anybody else. And, and then he has a plan, and I was created for him. Of course, some of you know Ephesians chapter 2, and it talks about how we're saved by grace through faith, and it goes on to talk about these good works, and, and we've recognized that the Greek word there, the, the word for those good works, we are God's masterpiece. Isn't that cool? His fingerprints made a masterpiece, for he created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You'll notice in my theme today that your identity isn't something that just happened in this generation. Before the foundations of the earth, God began to shape you and make you and give you a purpose. When I think about that, I think about my own life and who I am. And I grew up on a farm, some of you know, uh, just in western Minnesota. And seven kids in our family. I'm the youngest. And my dad had his own acreage, about uh, 400 acres. And we grew corn and we raised pigs and we raised cows. And I need to tell I like cows. Uh, every time we're out driving around and I see a cow, I turn to my wife and she says, you like cows. I really like cows. <laughs> and, and driving around, I love farms. I love the smell. I, I love even pitching manure. It's, it's just all right. And I need to tell you that out of the seven of us kids, not a single one of us stayed on the farm. Now, now some of you grew up on a farm as well and understand it was diff different. I was the youngest of seven, and my dad, Harry Johnson, strong man, a great farmer, didn't want that for me. Um, I have two brothers with PhDs. All of us graduated from college. I mean, he sent us all to school. He made it through the eighth grade. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, my dad, I was so, so proud of him, but I never, ever was a partner with him. He never ever let me find my place on the farm. He would send me out to the field and tell me exactly how to drive the tractor, and I'm 18 years old. He'd tell me which way to go and what to do and when to come in and when to go out, and, and I was a hired hand. He never ever made me feel like I had a purpose on the farm. Now, now that's a little bit of a wound in me. I'm just sharing that with you. I, I look back and I say, well, why couldn't he have shared his life with me, and why didn't he want me to partner? Well, he, he thought I was created for something different or better. But I never found my purpose with my father. Some, some of you understand what I'm talking about. In your family, you never ever felt that you kind of fit, that you had a purpose there. And you've been looking for it in the world somewhere and other people. And that's why so many people get, get involved in a relationship that they shouldn't because they think their purpose is in that relationship or in a job that probably doesn't fit them. And I've discovered in my life what I learned from my father is this. No, God created me for a purpose. And it's not to come alongside my dad and fulfill his plan. It's to come alongside my heavenly father and realize that he has a purpose and a plan for me. And it's perfect. Planned for us long ago. And when I'm walking according to the purpose of my heavenly father, it's then that my identity governs all my circumstances. And I need to ask, are you doing that today? Some of you feel a little bit like I did growing up, and you feel even out of place here today. And the reason that you don't really fit in church is you've never discovered your purpose here. And that's why I love what Laura does with Discover and tries to walk people through the purposes of God for their life. And we really want you to find, not, not that we can fill open spots, and, but rather I would hope that you could find the community here where you fit in and you realize there's a plan for me that was prepared long before I was created. And I just want to say, if you're a daddy today and, and you have children, I know it's not efficient and it's not easy, but include them in the work you do. Br bring them along with you. Show them what you do and, and help them to find their purpose. D don't lay on them what they need to be done. I initially didn't want to become a pastor. You know why? When, when I was born, the doctor lifted me up and he spanked me. That's back when they spanked the kids. 
I must have been really ugly. He spanked me twice. And he handed me to my mom and he said, here's your missionary, Millie. And my mom told me that story almost every day. And I wanted to be a computer scientist. And I went off to computers and she kept calling me to be a pastor. And eventually I became a pastor and my mom said, I told you so. <laughs> you know, why am I sharing that? Because my mom saw a greater purpose than I ever saw in my life. Can you do that with your kids? Call it out of them. I've been created as an original with a purpose to be in his family. I know who I am, yes, and I have this good, good father. And I love what it says in Ephesians. If we go back a, a few chapters from chapter 3, it said this long ago, even before the, he made the world, God loved us and chose us. Isn't that? Before he made the world, God knew what he's going to make, and it was you, and he loved you. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. Isn't that just a great verse? That God thought of me, and though I wandered away from him in my sin, and every one of us have, he wanted to adopt us back into his home, his family. This prodigal father, this father who is overwhelmingly generous and blessing, he gives and he gives and he gives again with an unfailing love. He wants you to be a part of his family. The verse that we often use when we talk to people is John chapter 1. To all who receive him, who believe in his name. It's more than just believing about God. It's actually receiving him as our father and saying, I want to be in your family. It says in Psalm that, verse 68 that he takes the lonely, sets them in families. That's one of my great promises. He takes all of us in this room, sets us in a family. If we would just trust him. That's what it means to believe and to receive. It, it's trust him. And if you're willing to trust God, he gives us the right to become his children. Last night we were out at the lake and we baptized 13 people. Man, it's fun. There's no lightning and thunder, so a little adventure was gone, but it was still great fun. And we had two people from India, first time, one, one from a Hindu family, the first member of his family that came to Jesus. And, and we had two Chinese friends, and, and they had just come to Christ here just a short time ago. had come over doing their Ph.D. work, and Christians helped them move and, and began to be a part of their life. And we had uh, two people from Mexico. It was just awesome. The whole world was there. We had some Swedes and Norwegians. It was wonderful. <laughs> and this is the family. They're my brothers and sisters. And what we're celebrating in those baptisms is, is this new life in Christ. Can, can you tell me what time it is? They took my clock away. Oh, no, I'm supposed to be done, okay? <laughs> Just remember, I'm family. <laughs> so when you go to get your kids out, is that brother of ours, he went a little long, okay? <laughs> to be greatly loved by my father. Just, just so significant. To be loved by him. See what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That's how much he loves us. How much he loves you. I've been a little distracted this last week by the NPR raccoon, have you? <laughs> you know, as I've looked, listened to this story, I, I need to tell you it's just so goofy because it just tells me that people don't like the current news feed, right? They don't like what's going on in the world, so they turn to a raccoon climbing up a building. <laughs> now, if you know the stories in St. Paul and this poor little raccoon, 15 hours, climbed the 25 stories, and the whole world was watching. So first of all, the world's fascinated with this. Secondly, it just tells me all, we all want to see an underdog win. <laughs> All of us want to see somebody who's down rise up. But thirdly, people really turn to love this little raccoon. My, my daughter bought a t-shirt. You can get a bobblehead now. All these things with this raccoon. You know, they grow up and they bite you. They're nasty. But people fell in love with this little guy. See? Oh. Do you know how God looks at you? Oh. He, he, he's just pulling for you to climb to the top. He, he wants you to reach all that you can be in his eyes on you. The world might not see you, but he sees you. And this good, good father has placed in you all that you need. You are an original, created by him with a purpose to be in his family because he loves you that much. That's the good, good father. And you're loved by him. If you're struggling in your home, maybe as a dad, and you find it really difficult, come down and pray with our team. If, you, if you've lived in a family where you weren't loved by your father, and you pushed the Heavenly Father away, maybe it's time to just tell him that with somebody listening. 
And I think some of you need to come down and just pray with our team before you go today because you're facing an identity crisis because you're in a trap right now. It's time to break free. Let's pray. Father God, you are the good, good Father. And I'm so grateful that I'm loved by you, that we are loved by you. Show us what that means. Change who, how we see ourselves. And I pray that we might learn, just like Pam, that our identity in you, that can govern, overcome any circumstance we face if our identity comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen.